I've been both a managing partner and built a boutique law firm. My entire adult life has been spent upon maximizing the profit at law firms, and I've identified six things that'll make your law firm more profitable. If there's one thing I know for sure, it's that every law firm can in fact be more profitable. We, we do sophisticated, complicated work for our clients, but at the end of the day, our businesses, they are incredibly simple. But there's a better way, a way that's better for both the client and your firm. And the first is to look for a business model that moves away from the billable hour. For the last 75 years, we have measured the value that we deliver to our clients in six minute increments. But it's not a proxy for what constitutes value to your clients. Um, your clients know at the end of a deal, at the end of a litigation, at the end of a closing, whether or not the work that you did benefited them. And the amount of time you invested in that work is not a proxy. It is not commensurate with the amount of value that your clients receive. Litigators, they've relied upon contingency fees for decades. Um, real estate lawyers are moving towards hybrid or flat fees because they built sophisticated documents that they can use over and over again as leverage. Um, hybrid fees are becoming um, more and more common in our business. Um, entrepreneurial lawyers are looking for ways to deliver value to their, to their clients in ways that aren't measured in the number of minutes they devote to a project. Selling our time in six minute increments is not something that our clients want. It's simply the mechanism that we have adopted generation after generation as lawyers as a way to try and identify what it is we should get paid in a transaction. We, we live in a world of leverage. Um, Wall Street has given leverage a bad name, but at the end of the day as a business owner, leverage is how you make more money. Capital can be leverage. Technology can be leverage. Associates, paralegals, they can be leverage. They are all tools in which the output of your firm is increased for your benefit as the owner, your benefit by way of profit, your benefit by way of more billings that go out the door um, without additional labor, without additional time um, on your part. There's no one size fits all um, to serve every law firm um, that exists out there. Um, again, you have to find the leverage, you have to find the, the, the model that is correct for your firm. At our firm, I try and make sure that 20% of the work that we're doing is always on a contingency basis or always on a success fee basis. Uh, I have friends who, who run very successful practices who have moved entirely away from the billable hour. Uh, they work exclusively on an outcome-based component that's not just a contingency fee. Um, it can be transactional work. Uh, it can be litigation that has X dollars if a particular result is received. Y dollars if a different result is, is received. And at the end of the day, your clients will thank you if you align your economic interest with theirs in a way that just doesn't measure your time. The second factor that can maximize the profit at your firm is to find a subspecialty. Um, the days of a solo practitioner getting out of law school, finding a mentor, moving into private practice, putting their shingle up and becoming a general practitioner those days are over. Um, of course, that's still the way lawyers work in some rural areas. Of course, there's the exception that proves the rule. But at the end of the day, we live in a world, right or wrong, in which generalists are not perceived as providing the same value as specialists. Generalists are often perceived in the marketplace as providing a commodity service, whether it be doctors, whether it be lawyers, or whether it be some other profession. So the second way in which you can maximize your income, maximize the profit at your firm, um, is to not just find a specialty. Um, that's what you needed to find 20 years ago. What you need to find is a subspecialty. So I, I'm a, I'm a bankruptcy lawyer, um, but my subspecialty is I do debtor work. I do debtor work for corporate clients. Um, so I'm not just a bankruptcy lawyer. Um, I stick to my subspecialty. If a bank comes through the door uh, and needs representation, I don't take it. I farm that work out to someone else. I refer it to someone else who then will refer me back debtor work. Subspecialization not only increases the amount that you can charge, but it also increases your referral base. Because as each of us in the marketplace find ever smaller finite components that constitute our specialty, 
we find more and more ways to refer, refer work to one another. The third way that your firm can maximize its profit is to find the right metrics that you need to measure. Um, much talk is made of KPIs, key performance indicators. Much talk is made of all the data that exists in the world. And you can certainly find yourself going down a rabbit hole looking either at the wrong data or looking to splice it in too small an area. But from Moneyball to the sprinkler clock that's automated that collects data that waters my yard, um, smarter decisions are made in business. Smarter decisions are made in our marketplace by analyzing data. Um, what is the web traffic that comes to your site? Where are they coming from? Who are they? Who are prospective clients? Um, these are all indicators that from a marketing component, um, you need to be paying attention to. But there's a formula. There's a formula for the profit that you take home at the end of the day. And it is the most important KPI for you to pay attention to. And what is that formula? Your net profits, your income is you, plus any leverage you have, whether they be associates of counsel, whether they be paralegals, whether they be technology. It is you plus your leverage multiplied by your billing rate, multiplied by your utilization, multiplied by your realization, and at the end, multiplied by the margin. So let's break those down. First and foremost, billing rates. Um, in large part, outside of your control. Um, geographic, location, um, specialization, subspecialty, the type of work you do, and the supply-demand curve. They all play an impact in how much you can charge in the marketplace um, at the end of the day. But again, as we'll talk about here in a few moments, having the highest billing rate possible, having the highest realization for your time in an alternative, uh, uh, in an alternative billing structure, bringing the most revenue in is the first and, and, and largest component uh, to the formula uh, at the end of the day. What is your utilization rate? Um, it's not the number of hours that you work. Um, I've had far too many lawyers that I work with, whether they be partners, associates, or the like, who try and tell me that all hours are created equal. Um, and the simple fact is they are not. Um, intangible hours, whether they be mentoring, whether they be marketing, um, whether they be administrative work, are they important? Of course they're important. But at the end of the day, they don't produce revenue. So for you, what is it that is your highest and best use that maximizes your utilization? Your utilization is the, is the number of hours that you work that result in revenue coming in at the end of the day. And the simple reality is that most of us, most lawyers in the world, spend far too much time working on things which they shouldn't be working on. Um, they work on administrative tasks. Um, they work on, on functions within the office that should be delegated to someone else because you shouldn't lower your utilization. You should, you should engage in the highest and best use that you have for the performance of your firm, for the realization of revenue, for the realization of profits. Um, that is the utilization rate that you look at. The next factor to look at is realization. Um, realization is how much of the billable time that you have goes out the door and is ultimately paid by a client. Um, billable hours are not all created equal. I've had far too many partners, I've had far too many associates that work for me um, who were slow to get their time in, um, wrote down their own time, produced time that was too late. Um, at the end of the day, Realization isn't getting your time in the system. Is it isn't, isn't even getting your time onto an invoice. Realization is how often are you paid for your time at the end of a case. If you're paid 95% of the billings that go out the door, um, your profits will be substantially higher than, than, than if you are paid 80% of the billings that you have uh, at the end of the day. A billable hour that is not sent to a client or a billable hour that is sent to a client and not paid is the same as a vacation hour to your pocketbook at the end of the day. The next component to pay attention to is margin. Um, margin is your net income divided by the fees that you generate. Um, this is where many a lawyer has wandered off uh, the path uh, and impacted their own business performance. Um, Different practices, different lawyers um, have different margin. Um, criminal practices often involve having investigators. 
Um, intellectual property practices often have paraprofessionals or clerks who, who have to do research, who have to prepare documents. Um, lots of different practices have different cost structures. Um, and there's also a very different approach to what a billing structure might be. Um, M&A work at the largest of firms, um, $1,500 plus an hour. Everything that they do is billable. Their margins are high. Criminal work in a local community um, doing DUIs, um, flat fee, smaller money, takes more resources. You have to invest whatever time it takes to go to trial. The margin on those cases are lower. And so lawyers disproportionately pay too little attention to what their margin is um, at the end of the day. The easiest way for you to stay on top of the most important metrics that you use um, is to use cloud-based software, um, whether it be Clio, whether it be one of their competitors. Um, if uh, there, there are individual software packages for discrete uh, uh, practice areas like criminal, uh, for discrete practice areas uh, like personal injury. But at the end of the day, you need to figure out what it is that constitutes both your weakness and your strength. And you should focus on those things that drive profit to your firm at the end of the day. If you have bad habits and you don't get your bills out on time, that's where you should be focused. If you have too little work, you need to go out and market. Um, if at the end of the day, you suffer from taking too many clients, some of whom don't have the ability to pay uh, your rates and your work goes unrealized, that's what you need to be focused on. Um, to figure out how it is to maximize your profit by looking at your key performance indicators, by looking at the most important metrics, you need to do a self-assessment of both the strengths of your firm and the weaknesses of your firm and decide what's the highest and best use of my time. Where is it should I focus? What is it that I need to strengthen? And what is it that I need to stop doing? I have never turned down a client months, years, decades later, thought to myself, boy, I wish I hadn't turned that client down. But I've taken too many clients. I've taken clients that I knew would be difficult to pay. Uh, I've taken clients that I knew would make decisions that might not be in their best interests. Um, I know I've taken clients uh, at the end of the day that I probably wasn't the right lawyer for the problem that they had because our personalities didn't mix. Our, our uh, assessments of life, our, our risk profiles, they weren't as compatible as other lawyers in the world. And so to me, at the end of the day, one of the most important things you can do in evaluating um, the metrics to make your firm more profitable is to identify who is it that is your ideal client but more importantly, identify the client that isn't right for you and to say no at the end of the day. Fourth component that is sure to make your firm more profitable is delegation. Um, wow, have I heard my partners, have I heard my friends, have I heard practitioners in this industry say things like, well, my client expects me to draft this pleading. I've heard them say things like, it would take me longer to explain the work to, uh, to someone else than to just do it myself. Um, these things, these are not true. Your client, they in fact don't want you to draft all of the paper. They want you to be the quarterback. Uh, I've, never in my, I've never in my professional career had a client complain that I had an associate, that I had a virtual associate, I had a freelancer do the work. They don't want to pay me at my hourly rate to do work uh, uh, that could be delegated to someone lower. Um, of course, I have to take ownership of it at the end of the day. Of course, I need to be the person who's putting the strategic thought, the, uh, the outline of what it's gonna look like, thinking far down the road as to how we're gonna argue it in court. Those are all things that fall to me. Um, those are what my highest and best use is. But I promise you, young associates, freelancers, they can research better than you. Um, I promise you uh, that they can take your instructions. They can synthesize the information that you give at the end of the day. It's your job to be the quarterback. This is the most important piece of advice I was ever given by my mentor. 
Um, and it is in fact the primary reason why I co-founded Lockwork. Um, having left a bigger firm with more resources to a boutique firm where I enjoy my practice, I enjoy my life, I make more money. Um, everything is better at a boutique smaller firm for me than it was at a larger firm with one exception. I don't have the resources that I had at that larger firm. Um, I don't have the ability to delegate. Uh, and so um, I have a stable of associates who do work for me and consistent with what we talked about earlier. I try and keep them 100% busy. Um, but there comes times, the, the peaks and valleys of a case in which we have more work than, than that pool of associates, than I have the time to do. Uh, and that's where we turn to virtual associates. That's where we turn to freelancers. That's where we turn to leverage in a way to get the work done, to do the best work we can for our clients, um, to, to, to win their cases, to, to lean on subject matter experts. And we do that by leaning on freelancers and virtual associates to go from that 100% that we keep our folks busy to some days we need there's 120%, some days there's 140%. Some days it feels like there's an insurmountable amount of work that needs to be done by the end of the week. But the business model that we've adopted, that's not only best for our clients, not only best for the product, uh, for the product that we turn out, the written paper, the arguments we make, but what's best for our bottom line is to delegate to folks to get us not only subject matter expertise, but to get us from that 100% to the 120% that is the workload that we face on a, on, a, on a fairly regular basis at our firm. Imagine how that compounds over the course of days, weeks, months, and years. Um, my firm, we spent over $100,000 last quarter uh, hiring virtual associates and freelance lawyers to do that work that was above and beyond what we could handle in-house. We found the best, the brightest people we work with week in and week out, at that $100,000 investment um, produced more than $250,000 of billable time that came back to us. Um, but it didn't just benefit us, it benefited our clients. My rate is far too high to, to be spending time drafting pleadings. My rate is far too high to be going through documents the first time around. The way that you can best deliver value to your clients is to have the lowest billing rate of someone who's competent to do the job. And so for us, it's getting young lawyers to go through documents. For us, it's having someone we can lean on for subject matter expertise like tax or securities work or criminal work um, when, when we don't have a full-time need for those people. Over the course of months and years and decades, it will have a meaningful impact and does have a meaningful impact uh, into the bottom, bottom line of our firm, um, again, in a way that's win-win for both us and the client. Fifth, probably the easiest of the six things that we're gonna talk about today to improve the profitability of your firm is to manage your AR and your WIP, your work in progress. Um, at many firms, accounts receivable, AR, represent more than six months of, of, of billings. Um, I've seen firms, I have friends, uh, where their AR and their WIP exceeds a year of the productivity of their firm. Um, and that's just simply insane. Um, that is not only not managing um, your AR and your WIP, it's mismanaging your AR and your WIP. I'm about to make a really big generalization here, uh, and I'm self-aware of it. Um, but some of the smartest and best lawyers I've ever met have the worst billing practices, uh, the worst billing habits. Um, they're so dedicated to their clients that they put their clients' interests first. Just today, I had a conversation with one of my partners in which I said, today's one of those days that you need to work on your business, not your client's business. Um, you can't do the best work for your clients until you manage your own business. And getting your AR out on time, getting your work in progress billed and out the door um, is the most important, the fastest way for you to increase the profits at your firm. You have fixed overhead, you have staffing costs, you have rent, um, you have all the costs associated with running a business. You have your gross revenue. When you take those costs out, that profit that's left, 
well, that's what you take home. Um, those costs are fixed. And so every incremental dollar that you capture from, from, from the fixed cost structure that you have is a dollar that you put in your pocket. Um, the most important thing that you can do to, uh, to, to, to increase, to manage your AR and your WIP is contemporaneous time billing. Um, without exception, lawyers who go back and recreate their time at the end of the week, at the end of the month, or God forbid it be longer than that, um, they lose time. They lose descriptions. Um, and invariably, invariably, they lose money that constitutes profit at the end of the day. The second thing I'll tell you, something that we try very, very hard to do at our firm, is to ensure that we transmit our bills to the clients by the fifth, fifth of the month. Um, clients have short-term memories. Um, you get a big win. Um, it starts to fade. What have you done for me lately is a mentality that clients have when it comes to our bills. Um, what bill gets negotiated? The cold, the old, the stale bill is, that the, is the one in which the client comes back and says, I needed 10%, I needed 20%. Sometimes they come back and say, I need a third or even half a bill written off before I'm willing to pay you. Um, this can all be solved if you not only keep contemporaneous time records, but you transmit your bills to your client on or before the fifth of the month. If it's not important enough for you to get a bill in your client's hands, why should it be important enough for your clients to pay that bill on a timely basis? Um, the next thing is don't let your old stagnant AR um, get past 60 days. Um, in all businesses, every single business, AR becomes less valuable with every day that it ages. Um, AR doesn't, by the way, just age after you've transmitted an invoice. Um, your, your, your billing, your entries, they age from the moment you put them in the system um, to the moment that they are paid. Bills that go past 60 days, every bit of statistics and evidence shows us that they are less likely to be paid on time, they are less likely to be paid in full, and they are the most likely invoices to be written off in their entirety, thus nullifying all that hard work that you did, yet leaving you with a fixed overhead that, that, that still needs to be paid. How many of us know a trial lawyer who's gone into a trial with AR in the 90 or the 120 day column? Um, those trials turn from hourly billings into the worst business model that lawyers can adopt, which is the contingent hourly fee. The one in which you say, well, I'm not going to get my hourly fee paid unless I win this case, unless I close this deal, unless this contract goes through. Um, those are the situations that you, as a lawyer, as a business person, as an entrepreneur, you need to avoid those situations at all costs because your AR, it ages poorly. You need to keep control of it. And if your clients go into the 60-day column, you need to cut them off. You need to fix it. You need to make arrangements. You need to have them put additional retainers in place because I guarantee you, when you look back at the ways in which your business has lost money on cases, this is the number one factor. This is the number one concern that you should have in maximizing the profit to your firm. This isn't rocket science. It's business 101. But these are the rules, these are the things that lawyers don't do that cost them profit at the end of the day. And finally, find your leverage component um, is the sixth factor I want to talk to you about. Um, the billable hour um, has only been around about 75 years. It came in a world in which we lived in a, in a world of factories, we lived in a world of farming, we lived in a world in which human output Output could be measured by time. How many widgets came off the factory platform, uh, the conveyor belt? Um, but we now live in a world of technology in which you can take your intellectual capital and leverage it. You don't have to sell it to just one client. We don't start with a white piece of paper. We start with forms. Some of um, the more sophisticated, entrepreneurial of us in, in, in this, in this uh, profession um, they have sophisticated form banks in which they steal clauses from here or there. Some of them have automated them. But at the end of the day, they are leveraging their intellectual capital for the purpose of benefiting the client. 
And this is where, whether it be technology, this is where, whether it be paralegals, virtual associates that we provide from law clerk, um, these are all the fastest growing ways in which you can supercharge your firm to increase the amount of revenue that comes in the door without putting any further input of your time and labor, thus maximizing your profit. Um, there are a fixed number of hours that you can work a day. 365 days a year is the most, uh, is the most that you have. Uh, and this is where the old axiom of work smarter, not harder, is what lawyers need to identify. And there's no better way to create that leverage than to begin automating your firm. Whether it's automating the client intake process, whether it's automating the way in which you populate a contract. We live in a world in which there are literally thousands of technologies that are designed to make you faster and more efficient at what you do. Um, so it's automation and it's scale. Um, associates, paralegals, they've always been a component uh, of, of what we do as lawyers at most firms to maximize profit, but there are new ways to do it. Um, that's why we built Law Clerk. It's, 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 we built it because we needed it as lawyers. We knew that there was a better way to do it. We could deliver better product to our clients. We could make more money at the end of the day. And when you can drive down the cost of legal services, yet produce a better product and make more profit, they come. Well, that's the gold standard by which professions are judged. We are in an evolutionary period in this industry, unlike anything legal has ever seen before. Um, firms will look different in 10 years. Um, firms will be um, their own business model. Um, some firms will, wor will work towards commoditization. Um, the biggest of firms will always have their bespoke bet the company work, um, work uh, at which general counsel could never be second guessed for the, the merger of, of Disney and Fox and, and hiring the most expensive and the most sophisticated of lawyers. But we as lawyers, our entrepreneurs at the end of the day, and as entrepreneurs, we need to find a better way to deliver products to our clients. That's our knowledge, that's our work, that's court, that's contracts, whatever it is that you deliver to your clients. Find a way to automate it, find a way to leverage it, and this isn't something that overnight is going to turn your firm into something more profitable, but over the course of a quarter, or over the course of a year, or over the course of a couple of years, you will see your profit continue to grow. You will see your profit continue to compound in a way that delivers to you, well, I think what you're entitled to, the value of what you deliver in a way that's more efficient. Um, so in conclusion, um, I spent my adult life at the intersection of the practice of law and the business of law. Um, every law firm I've ever been associated with or dealt with uh, can be more profitable. Um, we do some of the most important, complicated, and sophisticated things in the whole world for our clients. But our businesses are literally the simplest businesses that you can imagine. We bill our time, we bill a contingency, we bill a hybrid, we send, the, we send the invoice to our client, and we hope they pay. Like every other profession, we live in a world in which there's an increasing numbers of winners and losers. Um, um, it's, the, it's, it's the nature of the modern economy. Um, entrepreneurial lawyers are going to make more and more as the years go on. Uh, they will invent, they will reinvent, they will evolve, they will create new systems, they will create new products, new ways to deliver value to their clients for which they will be handsomely rewarded. But more and more lawyers will become employees. They'll be working for large conglomerates, they'll be working for governments, uh, they'll be working for corporations. And at the end of the day, uh, they are not going to, to have the success that entrepreneurial lawyers have. Um, this world of winners and losers, it's not just us. It seems to be every corner, every facet of our economy. Uh, and to quote the boss, you don't want to get stuck on the wrong side of that line.